You know, I come before you every day, or just about every day. It's every other day. I know Monday, Wednesday, Friday now, but it was every day for a long time. And uh, and we talk about the, the the COVID situation, and you know, we take questions, and sometimes the questions are, are not exactly COVID related, but uh, but most all the time they are. And and we're trying as best we possibly can to keep people abreast as what's going on. But today. And the reason we did it on a Thursday today, it's a little bit different. Now we've delayed our, you know, or, or not, not, we've delayed coming to you with the revenue numbers and everything, but I know a bunch of you got those numbers yesterday. We had so much going on yesterday, I absolutely didn't want to get into all the weeds and get into all the particulars about it yesterday. But uh, we have two, two things to talk about today. Revenue and, and an announcement in regard to broadband that will revolutionize the entire state of West Virginia. It is absolutely, it's just exactly the type of deal I like. You know, this is the real deal. I mean, that's all there is to it. It is an absolute monster step for the state of West Virginia. We'll get to that in just a second. Now, as far as the revenue numbers, you know, last year we started the year out in July and August and we were surely underwater significantly in those two months. And, and then we had to contemplate, you know, looking at the possibility of doing, you know, budget cuts or cuts, not, you know, cuts across the board, not necessarily budget, but, but cuts across the board and, and, and trying to figure a way that we we're going to be able to get through the year. Now, we held up on those and held up and held up and and we kept thinking, well, you know, the numbers just kept getting a little bit better as the winter came and through the winter and everything, and just a little bit better. And we kept whittling and whittling and whittling in this deficit that we had last year. And then all of a sudden, the, the COVID situation hit. A real cannonball to our stomach. And then on top of that cannonball, the federal government moved the tax debt, you know, the tax filing date from August, I mean, April 15th to July 15th. Well, those two cannonballs together to our budget and to our revenue last year, you know, were almost, almost, you know, killers in the, in the, we just thought, well, what are we going to do? Well, we worked and we, we did everything you could possibly do. And I give all the credit in the world, this great revenue department and all the, all the great work that, you know, Secretary Hardy and Mark and Mike and all the, 
all the people that you know were were supplying them that and everything. They did phenomenal work. You know our our you know state auditor. You know J B McCuskey and everything. Great work. And so as we as we have made our way through all the wickets and everything, lo and behold, we poof, we ran across the finish line with a surplus last year, which was unthinkable. Unthinkable. I'll promise you, I can't, I, I don't know this, but I don't, I would be really shocked if there were a, a numerous amount of other states that had anything like that level of success at all. So that was really, really good. Now, and then the great part about the whole thing is we knew by moving that the income tax into July, if we could get through last year, you know, look what an opportunity we'd have to start off the new year with a real hit and shot in the arm as far as, as, as a bunch of money coming in in July from the income tax filing, and it did. And we came up with a couple hundred million dollars of extra, of extra monies, which was terrific. And so... Then all of a sudden, July numbers started, come, come, you know, percolating along and coming in. And lo and behold, we kept watching and watching and watching, and boom, July comes in $44 million in addition to the income tax monies across, you know, uh, you know in excess of, what, uh, of budget. And so then we come to August. And naturally, we have put in numbers through the balance of the year that tie with what we passed in our last session and everything, but but those numbers going across, you know, through the, through the years, we we feel like that what we did is we had this backlog of the 200 million that is in July in excess cash that came in in July, a cash surplus, and we feel like that what we'll have to do is draw from that and draw from that, and we may still very well have to do that. You know, and, 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 you know, we'll have to pare that down and pare that down and pare that down. And that will be our lifeblood that gets us through the year. But so far, so far, so good. Because now August has come in with a third, you know, the actual numbers are a $35.8 million surplus in addition. At the end of August now, we have general revenue and in, in, we have general re, in the general revenue fund cash flow, cash flow. At the end of August, we have $244.3 million. It's unbelievable because it's comparing to last year with no COVID, no COVID situation. Last year at the end of August, we had $21.9 million. We have almost, we do have, we do have, We've got 12 times as much cash right on hand right now as we had last year with no COVID situation at the end of August. So, you know, I've got uh, our Secretary of Revenue with us today, you know, Secretary Hardy, and there's all kinds of different indicators and everything, and great work by Mark Mukow and, and great work by Mike Cook, great work by lots and lots and lots of people and everything. And we're going to be able to go through a lot of stuff with you today. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let our secretary go through it right now real quick. And then, and then we'll jump on to another an announcement. Thank you very much, Governor. I, as you said, looking back at April, we had two goals. One was to get to June 30th and finish fiscal year 20 in the black. And we did that, and we were able to book a surplus. But right behind that, we were very, very concerned about what the first quarter of fiscal year 21 would look like. In other words, July 1st of 2020 through September 30, 2020. And to date, we're two thirds of the way through that quarter. We are very, very, very pleased with the state's revenue performance. And of course, we announced July, but today, Today, I want to give you some detail about August because you don't get a good number like we had in August. In other words, almost $36 million above revenue projection unless you have a number of good indicators. And let me share with you some of the indicators and share with the people of West Virginia. Uh, as you said, our cumulative surplus for July and August is $80.3 $80 million a year ago we were $49 million below what our revenue estimate was. So we've gone from $49 million below a year ago 
to 80.3 million above, and that is a tremendous, in itself, a tremendous accomplishment. But we always try to look behind the numbers. If you look at our personal income tax collections, they are up about uh, almost 2% ahead of last year. And more importantly, and this is an indication of employment, our wage and salary withholding numbers are up 9.2%, which is just a tremendous good number. It indicates that people are working and that their withholding taxes are being withheld and coming into the state treasury. And that is one of the main numbers that Mark Muco looks at as our state's economist. Also, the other number that we use religiously and is always an indicator of how West Virginia's economy is doing is our consumer sales tax number. Last month, that number was up by 9%, and we weren't sure what to think of that because we said, well, maybe that's just an aberration. This month, the number is up 6.1%. So our consumer sales tax number now for two months in a row has far exceeded our expectations. As far as cash flow, as you pointed out, Governor, a, a year ago, our cash balance was a shade under $22 million. As on, on August 31st, which was three or four days ago, our cash balance is 20 times what it was a year ago. And it's amazing what difference year can make. I remember last year at this time, it was actually this week, a year ago, we were looking at possibly deciding whether we were going to make a budget cut and actually put the idea out to our agency heads that we might have to consider a budget cut. That didn't happen. The economy rallied under the leadership of the governor. The state's finances kept getting better and better, and we were in great shape in March before this pandemic hit. So we've had our share of challenges. April, May, and June, we needed to finish the fiscal year, and we did it knowing that if we could do a good job, we could have $200 million in tax revenue that would carry us into what we thought might be a bad quarter, which would be the first quarter of 21. To date, two-thirds of the way through that quarter, we are doing very, very well. So we were able to hold on to the $200 million of deferred revenue, which is why we have such an excellent, excellent cash balance. So everything is good. The, those of us in the revenue department, we're not known to be optimists. We're cautiously optimistic at all times. But Mark Muco and Mike Cook and I have worked with the governor day in, day out, almost every day, talking about where we're going and where we've been and we'll continue to do that. And if we keep continuing to have numbers like these, we are going to have an excellent first quarter of fiscal year 21. So with that, Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, let me say just a couple things. First of all, the Revenue Department are never optimists. <laughs> you know, I'm, I mean, to say that they're optimists, are you kidding me? No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. The second thing is, you know, I want to correct one thing, Dave, you know, Dave, I think you said that the number, you know, we were at 22 million last year in August, and now we're at 244, and that's 20 times, uh, you know, that's, that's 12 times. 12 times. 12 times. And, and, and so, so that was just a mistake. But, but nevertheless, uh, I, I, want to just, I want to just say this, you know, I know there's still a lot of people that are out there in West Virginia and a lot of different places that are still hurting, and I know that we've, we've lost uh, now 237 people, and for those families, we've, we've got to keep them in our thoughts and prayers and, and, and know just what a tough time they're going through. And, and so the net of the whole thing is just this, is the show still does go on. It always goes on. And no matter how hard, yeah, that's fine. You know, no matter how hard, now wait just one second, guys. No matter how hard the situation may be, you know, we've got to continue to do our job and continue to work. You know, like I said, this job, it's really lonely. And, uh, and it's really tough when you're trying and you know your people are doing a great job and you, you're trying to do any and everything you possibly can do to help in every direction. And then, you know, you, you, you catch a lot of 
a lot of crap along the way, but you just keep going. Now, I've looked at that as an honor, and I'm going to continue to look at it that way. But I absolutely know that there's people out there that are really hurting, and I don't want to just come in and cloud the entire air with, oh, it's great, things are great, and things are great, because for those people, we need to continue to try to turn every rock over to help every single West Virginian we possibly can until they're all helped, until everybody's helped. And for those that have lost loved ones and everything in this situation, you know, we don't forget. We just don't forget. Now, I can tell you this. I think we've got a couple of signs and everything to show and everything, but, uh, and, and, and they'll, I guess they'll come up right behind me here somewhere, but, but nevertheless, if you look, on, and, and that's on my right, you know, you've got a cash surplus now for two months, ending in July and August for year 2021. The year that we're in right now, you know, because our year goes from July 1st through June 30th of 2021. And so that's how we, we relate to it and, and how it all works out. But you got a cash surplus of $244.3 million. And over on the other side, you've got a, uh, a, a monthly, sur a, a, a two month surplus of 80.3 80 million, and that's two thirds of the way through our first quarter. And uh, we still know, and we go at this cautiously, we still know we're probably going to draw down some of these dollars and everything as we go along. But I'm telling you, West Virginia, we continue to be the miracle. We continue to be the envy of this nation, and that's what we want to be. Because as we do that, we change our image. We change who we are, or who, not who we are, but who we have been perceived to be. We become the diamond in the rough. We become the place where everybody wants to come to be able to live, to bring their businesses, to absolutely you know, have all the great opportunities and the greatness the, the bounds in this state everywhere. So, so you know, I, I am tickled to death with the numbers, and we want to just keep on pitching these kind of numbers and everything. We don't want to forget anybody, anybody that's still, you know, having a tough way to go, and we want to, we want to reach out and try to help in, in any and every way we possibly can. But uh, that's really all I've got today, and, and, you know, I commend, like I said, all the hard work of the revenue people. They probably get sick and tired of seeing me the very last thing in the day. <laughs> but I give them all day because I don't want to meet with them at 10 o'clock in the morning and then hear, you know, that there's things that blew up in, in the la latter part of the day. Because my day goes on. I know their day, their day goes on too. But, uh, but I, I just, I, so, so for all that time that we spent together day after day after day, I thank you. Great work, guys. Great, great work. You know, and so, so that's all I've got in regard to, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, our uh, revenue numbers and everything. And I, I congratulate all West Virginians on all the great work and it's good stuff. Good, good stuff. Now, now we've got a bunch of guests on with us and we're going to hear from them in just a minute. But uh, we've got an announcement today that is probably just as big as big can get. And that is just this. We all know that our state is so deficient on broadband, it's unbelievable. And we all know that. And we all know that we've been trying to play catch up and we've been trying to, you know, we throw two aspirins and a can of uh, tomato juice and a jar of uh, orange juice at the situation and we think we're making broadband better. And we probably are. We probably are, but at the end of the day, it'll take us a hundred lifetimes to get up to where others are, and by that time, there'll probably be other developments that will have come about and everything, and we'll be chasing that rainbow and never get there. But today, we're going to show you how we are going to get there, and we're going to get there across this state that is going to be just unbelievable. You know, if I could just read to you a couple things, 
and that is this. The FCC has created a program called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund to efficiently fund the deployment of high-speed broadband networks in rural America. And through a two-phase reverse auction mechanism, and, you know, I'm sure lots and lots of people are wondering, what in the world is that? And maybe we'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. The FCC will direct billions over 10 years to, re to, to finance broadband networks in unserved rural areas connecting millions more American homes and businesses. Now, they're not going to spend billions in West Virginia, but there's almost $800 million that's just sitting out there for the taking. And we have struggled in lots of ways because it's going to expire on the taking, I think, sometime in October. So we got to move. We got to move. And the only way that we're going to be able to reach out and grab $766 million to come to this state to do construction work throughout all parts of the state that have no or very, very, very little broadband access. Now, that's $766 million, which is all the money in Texas just about, but it's going to come to West Virginia if we can figure out how to do one thing, and that is we've got to be able to underwrite and help our people be able to achieve the bonding of the people that will have the opportunity to bid on this work and get this work up and going. I think February is the time frame that the work's going to go up, up and going. So here's the problem. We have a cap of $50 million within the state, and we have a cap per, 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 per entity of $10 million. We need, to, in order for this thing to really flow, to increase the overall cap, and that's, and that's what we're talking about so today. So today, in order to make this program work, and this is, a, and I think this is called an EDA insurance fund, but in order to make this program work today, I am signing an executive order which removes the regulatory caps from the Broadband Infrastructure Loan Insurance Program under the Board of Treasury Investments, which is chaired by our, our, our treasurer, John Perdue. The caps must be removed because they are preventing the state from responding to the emergency that we have on hand for all the different aspects of all the different things from, from direct learning, from absolutely, from all the different medical components of this, so many different things that if we had broadband now, we would be able to be serving our, our citizens in a lot better way. So I'm also directing the West Virginia Economic Development Authority under Secretary Gaunch to limit the application's approval from this fund to no more than is necessary for the first year of this program. Today I am announcing that I will propose legislation at the next legislative session to replace the caps on the use of this fund. So basically what's going to happen here is this. I, by emergency order, executive order, am going to remove the caps today. But before a dollar is spent, before a dollar is spent, the legislature will come back into session. I'll send up a bill, and they will actually review and establish the caps. But what we've got to do to meet this October date, to be able to reach out here and snag $766 million to cover up our state where we have deficiencies like crazy today is we got to move and we've got to move now. So I am tickled teetotally to death about this because I think this initiative across our state will be an incredible, incredible construction project that will employ hundreds if not thousands of people. You know, I have absolutely 
reviewed this extensively with our legislatures, and you'll see them in just a few moments. But here's the thing. We have now, in this situation, a truly bipartisan effort. We have our state treasurer. We have our state auditor. We have, you know, we have the minority and the majority sides of both the, the Senate and the House have all signed on. Everybody has come together with the ideas. This is anything but a Jim Justice idea in its, in its entirety. I just see the beauty of this gigantic deal for West Virginia. Now, in that, I want to say one other thing. I, I absolutely, we've had meeting after meeting about this, and, and truly, truly, there's been so many people that have stepped up, and your great, great, great senators, and your great legislators, and your great House members and everything, the state auditor, the state, the state treasurer, so many people. We just the other day, right amidst all this COVID stuff and, and schools turning orange and everything else, like I said, the show still has got to go on. But in that, now just think about it. In that just the other day, we had our Speaker of the House, our Senate President, we had, you know, we had phone calls going out to the, uh, to the minority leaders in the House and the Senate. We had, we had a, an additional House member that had you know, more information on this. We had our state treasurer, our state auditor, all of us, and we have been in constant contact with our Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey, on this as well. So many people have contributed to absolutely this idea, and I commend each and every one of them, and today we're going to have them on the call with us, but this is monumental beyond belief. And absolutely, this can absolutely revolutionize and change our state. You talk about a game changer, and Mitch, you're on the call and everything. We were teasing about you know, all the people using the word game changer. You know, well, this, believe me, B, is a mega game changer because not only will it give us the construction jobs and all the stuff that goes with that, but just think, just think of how how we're held back. We're held back from the world or our nation because we don't have broadband access all over the place here. And so many people would like to come, but there's no way that they can work from home. There's no way that they can come and have their businesses here. They can't do it because we're deficient. We're deficient in broadband. So this is a major move. But in addition, in addition to that, we are absolutely working, and I don't want to I don't want to throw all this in at one time and everything because we're not complete on this and that. But we've set aside $50 million of the CARES money for broadband. Now, and what we're trying to work on is this. We have maps of where we have broadband today. We overlay where this $766 million is going to come into West Virginia. Now, stay with me because this is, the, and I'm almost done. We have a map of where we are today. Then we overlay where we're going to be. Well, that's where we are today, okay? And I'm not absolutely positive about ex exactly, you know, that I agree completely with all that, but that's where we are today. And then we overlay what's going to happen when we overlay. Now, this is just what is, this is the 766 million, where that's going to come into play, okay? And th so, so then we're going to look like this. And all that's going to be covered. The red and the blue are all covered. Now, but you see we've still got white areas in, in some places within West Virginia. That's what we want to take the $50 million of CARES money that we set aside for doing just broadband. And we want to target those areas. And we want to go right now to those areas and target those areas, and then we got it. You know, at the end of the day, you know, what we want to do is we want to go, you know, from, from where we are to where we're going to be at 766, and then a, a target the 50 million to those areas right there, and we'll be covering up West Virginia almost as fast as we can turn around here 
We're going to cover up West Virginia with broadband. It's an announcement beyond belief. And the other thing I, I tell all these people, I just think of here we are in the midst of a COVID crisis beyond belief, schools going back, counties orange, can't play ball, all the different issues that are going on all around us. But all these people keep a clear head and keep moving north and keep doing great work for West Virginia. I can't thank them enough and everything. So, so I'll, I'll turn now to the, to the panel, let everybody talk a little bit, and that'll be great. And again, thank you, everybody. All right, our first guest today is President of the West Virginia Senate, Mitch Carmichael. Well, thank you. Thank you, Governor, for this initiative and for uh, explaining. I think you've done a great job explaining uh, the program. And uh, it is, as we use the overused words, a game changer. But it changes uh, the paradigm in West Virginia from one of looking back uh, to one of looking forward today. And this FCC program, and I want to give credit to our congressional delegation, as well as every uh, uh, bipartisan initiative within the legislature. The FCC has taken uh, the census blocks throughout America and identified where there is no service as defined by the uh, federal communication. So, and West Virginia has an inordinate number of those areas, those census blocks, and this program with your executive order and then with further legislative action will enable 121,000 households in West Virginia to have world-class broadband service. Uh, and so I want to thank you and thank those on the panel and, uh, and say to the world that uh, West Virginia uh, is a beautiful, wonderful place to raise your family. And this pandemic has highlighted all of those amazing benefits that we have in our state. And the only thing holding us back is uh, connectivity to uh, the outside world via world-class internet service. And this uh, program will uh, break that traditional impediment to our growth and our prosperity so that we can enable telehealth, distance learning, work from home initiatives, e-commerce, uh, and just the safety and security of our state. So thank you and thank you to everyone on the uh, call. All right, thank you, Mr. Let me jump in while Mitch is still here, just one second. I want to just say that, Mitch, you said it will enable us to have 121,000 households and everything within our state, but that is to provide additional access to 121,000. Is that not correct? That is correct. Uh, the, this program has identified 121,000 homes in West Virginia that do not have broadband service. And provides funding uh, that will enable uh, private sector internet providers to, to get fiber, incentivizes them to get fiber optic technology to each of those households and provide gigabit service, world class service. So, good point, Governor. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Next, we'll go to Speaker of the West Virginia House of Delegates, Roger Hanshaw. We're having a little bit of a connection issue there. Let's, uh, let's go on to the West Virginia State Auditor, J.B. McCuskey. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, no, you I'm go. unmuted. We got Sorry. you. I got you. Um, Thank you to the legislators out there for, for taking care of this and, and for, for having the foresight to, to, to look into this, this, this problem, particularly our congressional delegation. Um, as we try to rebuild West Virginia and, and to move ourselves forward, as I, I communicate with people that are from my generation, the ability to, to move home and to work is uh, hampered by, by internet, obviously, as, as the Senate president discussed. And I think as we're moving past COVID, I think people are going to see places like West Virginia as a great alternative to the urban lifestyle. This is a place where you can find a community where your church and school and work and home are all within five minutes of your house. 
Um, and if we can start to, to promote ourselves as a place where we have that lifestyle on top of having uh, world-class technology that enables uh, a work from home initiative, I think that something like this is going to change the way that our economy runs probably forever. And I think just to sort of put a bow on the reason that I'm sitting here, the reason uh, that, that I love this plan so much is that it is fiscally responsible and it's conservative. Uh, and so what this does is it uses the power of the government not to spend its money, but to make sure that private money is investing where it needs to be invested so that our state can move forward uh, and that we're leveraging um, the value of, of private capital to make incredible infrastructure and in investments in West Virginia. And so I'm really, really proud uh, of this uh, initiative. And I look forward to being able to work with people outside of West Virginia in the future and say, look what we have now. And I think this is a great first step to being able to do that. So thank you to everybody on the call. And, and we really look forward to, to putting shovel to dirt. All right, thank you. Next, we'll go to uh, West Virginia Senator Roman Prezioso. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I certainly wanted to uh, thank Mitch, President Carmichael, for including uh, us in this opportunity to alert the governor uh, on this particular issue. And as a former educator, I know how important it is to provide a quality education program for our students. It's imperative that we give teachers and students every opportunity, every alternative opportunity to get a good quality education. And Senator Plymo and I have been members of the Southern Regional Education Board for numerous years, and we've seen uh, what online courses will do at the higher education level. And I certainly believe this is the uh, way to our future, not only for our students, which, which is so important right now, as, as parents are so concerned about sending their, their students, their children to school. And we've got to provide, provide them with that safe opportunity. But education is, is on the forefront of, of everything I think about. And we've got to educate our students or we're going to lose a generation. And we can't afford to do that. The second thing, Governor, I had the opportunity to visit one of our state parks uh, over the past couple of weeks. And it was a major state park in our state. One that, you know, uh, we say that come to West Virginia, we provide you with so many opportunities, so many recreational opportunities, but there was no broadband. I contacted Senator or uh, former Senator Gonch, Secretary Gonch, and uh, alerted him of this. You know, people want to come to West Virginia. They can't. They, they, they are staying away from the big vacation areas like Myrtle Beach. And they need to come to somewhere where they feel safe. And also, one of the you know parents have the opportunity to work. And if we're going to provide this business opportunity, we got to provide this broadband service. So I thank you for uh, taking uh, heed of our letter. We certainly appreciate that. And moving forward as expediently as you can to provide only not only West Virginians, but the rest of the world to come to West Virginia and, and, and have a quality education opportunity or recreation opportunity or business opportunity. Thank you. And thank all the members here today for uh, joining in on this conference. All right. Thank you, Senator Prezioso. Next, we'll go to Senator Bob Plymel. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the governor for his leadership on this. Um, as a member of the Broadband Council, we've been reviewing this, looking at speed tests, uh, looking at all the uh, uh, lack of, um, of uh, opportunities we have to be able to expand broadband. And in this one step, the governor's really taking the action with the legislature and with the Broadband Council to move this state forward. I'm really tired of, uh, of people outside of the state making uh, decisions for us. Um, on broadband that we do not have a say in. And this is the governor taking the reins and really making those decisions and letting us help make those decisions to get the underserved areas served. So I, I appreciate this and I appreciate the leadership that, uh, that everybody has taken both in the Senate and the House and particularly um, my colleague in the, in the House that's from the same district that I'm in, in Delgate Linville, we've been working tirelessly on this to try to expand broadband. 
this really does it. Governor, thank you for doing this and uh, appreciate the leadership of the president and the speaker and uh, all the representatives here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Senator Plymouth. Next, we'll go to West Virginia State Treasurer, John Perdue. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be a partnership of this, uh, this very important thing, broadband. Coming from Southern West Virginia, I know how important this is gonna be to all of rural West Virginia and how it's gonna change the game plans, plan, so to speak. Give opportunities in the education beyond a lot of our young people's expectations. And it's desperately needed not only for that, but also, also for rural health care in Southern West Virginia and all over rural West Virginia. So I've traveled the state. One of the first things coming up is broadband. We have now come up with a solution. I want to I want to give the governor a praise for what he has done to bring everyone together to make this happen. And I, I want to also thank the Senate President who has really stepped up to the plate here and really pushed this issue because he understood uh, the importance of this issue all over the state. And I want to commend him for that as well as all of you as part of the team that is making this happen. We have worked on modern sewage. We know how that changes West Virginia. We know what the road structure and roads have changed West Virginia. And now we're putting the final piece together, I think, broadband, bringing the high tech internet access technology to all West Virginia, especially the rural counties of this great state. And I just want to thank all of you for your hard work and leadership. And I think West Virginia is just starting to shine. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you so much. All right, next we'll go to West Virginia Delegate Tim Miley. Thank you, uh, Governor, for inviting me to participate here today. Thank you for your decision to enter this executive order. I, I think it's important for us to always remind ourselves that it doesn't matter how much we talk about the great place West Virginia is to, to live and work and have fun. What's most important is for people outside the state to know that, because we, we already know that. They need to know that. And when we expand opportunities for them, such as broadband build out in our state, we become that appealing place where other people from outside the state and around the country want to come and live. The auditor, I think, said it best that we are in a time and will continue to be in the foreseeable future where people are realizing that densely populated urban areas may not be the most appealing place to live and work. And those same people have started looking for more rural areas to go work and live where they can buy more house for their money, more property and not be right on top of everybody, uh, right on top of their neighbors. And when West Virginia builds out high speed internet, we will become that place. So it is a real game changer for our state, I believe. Number two, I, I wanna thank um, Senate President Mitch Carmichael. He really spearheaded this effort from a legislative perspective. He has always been on the forefront of pushing for broadband expansion. I, I'm just sorry he won't be around next session to see the legislation passed that you will be introducing uh, governor or asked to be introduced and passed. And finally, I know whenever state money is involved or even talked about, whether you really appreciate what's going to happen or not, it's always important to have fiscal hawks and financial watchdogs on the job, making sure that the state's money is safe. And I could think of no better people for that to be done than our state treasurer, John Perdue, and our, and our state auditor, J.B. McCuskey. I'm, I'm very, very comfortable that between those two, keeping an eye on the monies that the state is guaranteeing for these projects to be performed, that very little, if any, in fact, I don't think any of the state's money is really being put at risk. So to the extent anyone had a question or concern about that, I'm satisfied with those two men on the job. So thank you again, Governor, for, for what you're doing and thank you for inviting me to participate today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you so much. All right, thank you. Next uh, to West Virginia Delegate Daniel Linville. Well, thank you, Governor. And thank you to everyone that's on the call today. You've all shown incredible leadership uh, as it regards uh, this issue. One of the first things that I want to get across to uh, the people of West Virginia watching at home, um, some of you may be saying, well, we've heard this before. Um, and I'd like to tell you why this is a little different. 
And so in this particular process, um, there are performance bonds that are going to be in place. There's $766 million that are available uh, from the federal government um, on the map that was shown. What I want you to know is that there are significant penalties if providers don't perform. And that's what is different this time. Um, we're bringing in at least $766 billion over a two round auction. But then on top of that, there can be private sector investment um, that, that matches these dollars uh, beyond even what the FCC is, is handing out. Um, particularly, I want to uh, say thank you to uh, both Senator Plymel and Senator Carmichael who have shown ex extreme leadership uh, in this process. Um, and in addition to that, I just wanna say that um, this is going to be lasting infrastructure. So once we get past COVID, once we get past all the current crises, this infrastructure is still going to be there. And so 10 years from now, I hope very much that we're looking back on this like the slam dunk that it is. Thank you, Governor, and thank you to each of the panelists. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate you, man. All right, thank you. We'll now take uh, questions from members of the media. Our first question today is from Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, Governor, do you plan to call a special session to have the legislature address this, or are you going to wait till you know after the first of next year when the session starts? Thank you, Charles. Right now, you know, from the standpoint of of the timing of how all this is going to you know come about, and the money's not really being expended in any way until well after the session coming, you know, the, the regular session coming in, there's, there's no real need in doing that. You know, we've got plenty of time. We'll come in at the, at, at the, at the regular time and, uh, and the legislatures will then be able to set the caps and everything and move forward. All right, thank you, Charles. Next, we'll go to Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Yes, Steve Adams of all the newspapers here. Let me make sure I understand this correctly. So we can pull down approximately $766 billion from the federal government for, in essence, public-private partnerships. We uh, can use some of that federal money to fund these projects. These companies can obviously put up some of their money uh, to, to match that. But this is kind of a public-private partnership program. Am I understanding that correctly? I, I really, you know, you know who would probably be, be able to answer that in a better way than myself is our president Carmichael. And I, I want to say this about, you know, our president. Now, just think about this. You know, I know that uh, Roman and Tim Miley are going to be leaving us this year and everything. And 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 what service they've given to the state of West Virginia is unbelievable. And we can never thank them enough. Never, never thank them enough. But. Uh, Mitch lost in the election in the primary. Now think about, just think about how you would feel. I mean, think about, you know, you feel like in your heart, you've worked hard and you lost in the primary. It would have been awfully, awfully easy to just say, well, you know, I'm gonna work out my days and everything and then I'm gonna go on about doing whatever in my life. But he didn't do that. You know, he kept digging and digging and digging for West Virginia. And so, to me, that deserves so much credit, and I really love him for it because he absolutely has been the trooper, the real trooper in this. Now, there's many others. You know, Bob Plymel came to see me right off the get-go. You know, all the people that have been on, on, on the call here today with us, look at all the great work that our congressional leadership has done all the people that are making this happen have all come together in probably the most bipartisan effort you could ever imagine, whether it be our great treasurer, you know, and John Perdue, or our great auditor and J.B. McCuskey, our great attorney general and Patrick Morrison. So many people have come together to make it happen. But in this one situation, really and truly, you know, Mitch Carmichael lost. It would have been so easy to drop your head he didn't drop his head. He kept digging and digging and digging. And so, Mitch, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And you answer this question. You'll answer it better than I. Well, first, thank you, Governor, for those very kind words. And, uh, you know, I'm touched by them. And I appreciate your uh, and everyone's uh, comments. Uh, it really does mean a lot to me. And, uh, you know, we all love West Virginia. So we're all working uh, to, to move us forward. And uh, with regard to your specific question, Stephen, 
you want to refer to it as a, a public partner or public private partnership. And it's really not. It's really a private entity that will be providing internet service in a competitive manner uh, across these 121,000 unserved homes. And that's really the beauty of the project. These, uh, the, but for the federal uh, funding for these uh, re very remote uh, homes in these remote census blocks, there would never be a private sector entity go uh, provide service in these areas. And so the federal government recognized that, not just in West Virginia, but in across America. And uh, uh, West Virginia is, uh, I guess, fortunate to get uh, a, a lot of this funding. In fact, a high, very high percentage of it as it relates to the rest of the nation. So uh, it's a private sector initiative. People are putting their own money on the line. The federal government's come in to subsidize it, uh, but there is, uh, it's, it's a private initiative and uh, it's good for West Virginia and creates competition. And uh, again, thanks to everyone on the call. This is a great day for West Virginia, really. The governor made this decision. We brought it to him as a group of legislators and others uh, and working with you know Tim and Bob and Daniel and Roman and uh, the speaker just to move this thing forward. And uh, the governor grasped it quickly and made a quick decision on it, which was the right thing to do. And now we're, it's really a great day for West Virginia. All right, thank you, Steve. Next, we'll go to Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Thank you. Just a general question to whomever wants to jump on it. The, the big impediment to broadband construction in West Virginia has been the lack of private businesses willing to take on the expense of the rough terrain and uh, small rural communities where you don't have the concentration that you have in large urban areas. And so it looked like that, that the people that didn't have broadband were not going to have broadband. Was this the key linchpin, the $766 million along with the state's guarantees? Uh, this was the linchpin that allows this construction now to go forward. You know, I, I'd love to hear from Bob Plymel, but I, I got I got to just tell you, Kenny. You know, it, it, that's just it. I mean, really and truly, that's plain it right there. You know, this opens the door. I mean, we've got broadband to a lot of people in our state. You know, but this additional additional. 121,000 homes, you know, in areas that we'd never have gotten to. And this program that's a federal program to go to the most rural areas and West Virginia being able to snag a great big, big chunk of this dollars and everything. And then everybody from a bipartisan effort getting behind it and trying to figure a way and then us being able to issue this emergency order to be able to meet the deadline or executive order so that we don't, we don't miss the date and this money just go poof and go away, you know, that, that's exactly it. But Kenny, in addition to that, with the CARES money that we have, the 50 million that we have set over to the side, when you saw that last map, come up where all the blue and all the red was, there were still some white areas, and those areas are still in need of broadband, and we can now try to some way take, and that's why we don't have it completely put together yet, but we're really, really close, some way come out with a way to be able to go to those areas with this $50 million that we have, and maybe we can almost get it all done and get everything done that was impossible to get done before. And, and absolutely, this will be the absolute linchpin that will drive us forward in the future beyond belief. It's a really great day, and I cannot thank the bipartisan level of effort. I mean, there could no way be anything that any state has done from a bipartisan standpoint any better. This is just good people with good heads coming together and making good decisions. All right, thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, panel. Uh, th that $50 million that you're talking about, Governor, do you believe that's going to be enough to address those areas? 
the rugged terrain has been an issue in the past. The, the hills have worked against West Virginia and broadband too. That $50 million in the, for that white area of the map, those spots, is that going to be the beginning or is it going to take a lot more than that? Well, and this was Paul, is that correct? You know, Paul, here, here's the thing. You know, when you, when you start with where we are today, I mean, we've got broadband in a lot of places today, but we know as a state we're still super deficient. But when you layer in 766 million, and maybe as we go forward, we'll even have more private participation on top of all that. But when you layer in that right off the get-go, and then you, you have these areas. Maybe 50 million won't get every single solitary house in the entire, in the entire state, but we're going to be where we're going to be able to look at West Virginia and say, West Virginia is surely not deficient in everything. And so, so it'll go a long, long ways. You know, you know there, there's, there's even, even things on the table of saying stuff like, well, well for every person, every, every household we hook up, you know, we'll take $1,000 of the $50 million and we'll incentivize for every hookup $1,000. Well, if that be the case, we'd be able to hook up an additional 50,000 homes. Well, before you know it, when you hook up 121,000 homes, 50,000 more homes, you've got 170,000 homes, plus all the hookups that what we already have, you know, you only have a big, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a million, 700 and almost almost a million eight hundred thousand people well if you put four people in each one of those households just in what we just said is uh six hundred eighty thousand people you know so so just in that not counting where we already have today but before you know it you see right real fast we've got west virginia covered all right thank you paul next we'll go to mark curtis with next star media uh, good afternoon, Governor and distinguished panel. Um, uh, I realize the two announcements we made today are significant newsworthy events, Governor, but I do have to ask a COVID-19 question uh, because uh, last night the CDC, uh, it was released that there was uh, some type of advisory from the CDC to the states to be prepared for the possibility, and I underscore the word possibility, that a vaccine may in fact be available for COVID-19 by late October and that the states should prepare for uh, that distribution if it comes to, to bear. Um, what do you know about that? What preparations are underway? How uh, efficient could this be? And, and how big of a deal might this be? Uh, we have received the notice, and General Hoyer is working this and everything. And uh, as is Bill Crouch, we've received the notice. It'd be, it would be, I mean, what a day. What a day. I mean, you just think about it. We've got incredible revenue numbers. We're announcing broadband that is absolutely knocking it out of the park beyond belief, and we've got a vaccine on the way possibly. What a day. What a day compared to the days we've had and everything. So if that, if that comes to pass, we'll be ready. I'll promise you we'll be ready in every way. You know, we, we, we surely, uh, you know, we sure been cautious, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, we sure want to be cautious about everything and hopeful, you know, and, 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 and prepared all at the same time. All right. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll go to Phil Kabler with the Charleston Gazette Mail. Hello, everyone. I wanted to go back to a budget question. Uh, considering that we've got an uh, infusion of about $900 million just from the uh, uh, federal supplementals on uh, uh, unemployment benefits, uh, to what extent is that affecting particularly the, uh, uh, the good numbers on uh, sales tax collections? Bill, I think it's, uh, it, you can't quantify exactly what effect those numbers have. I do know that they are, our numbers are better than we originally expected. I know our employment numbers are better, our withholding taxes up. So that would indicate, of course, that the economy is actually doing much better. 
As far as going and trying to quantify exactly what all those bucket grants have, what they mean in our numbers, that we don't have the expertise to do that. That would be very difficult to do. But uh, keep in mind, many of those grants that you mentioned are designated grants, we call them bucket grants, that are designated for a certain purpose. They don't come into the state general revenue treasury and they are directed towards certain recipients such as hospitals and schools. So they, you have to factor those numbers out when you're trying to read the economic effect of the CARES dollars. All right, thank you, Phil. Next we'll go to... Let me, let me discuss that in just a second. You know, there's no question that when somebody that's, uh, you know, lost her job is sent a check for $600 or $400 or an unemployment check, you know, there's no question that, uh, that it is beneficial to that person. You know, it's driven that way, Phil. And, and there's no question that then if they didn't have those dollars at all, that they couldn't spend those dollars. And, and there's no question that, uh, that that becomes somewhat beneficial to the state. However, however, you've got to know that these numbers that, that, that are coming into our state are rivaling numbers pre-COVID when these people were working, you know, and, uh, and you see what's going on all across our nation, you know, where people are getting, you know, evicted and our federal government is stepping up and saying, Stop that, and I, I am praying that you know, everyone, everyone abides by that. And our land, uh, our landlords and everything, I know it makes it tougher on you, but some way, somehow, we've got to keep people from being evicted from their homes. But, but the other thing, all these indicators are just this. You know, we're in a pandemic that ought to be destroying, destroying us economically. You know, from the standpoint of the additional stimulus package that Nancy Pelosi and, and the powers to be on the other side were all fighting with one another and they can't get it off the bubble and it hadn't, it hadn't gotten to the president yet. When that additional, additional stimulus package comes to West Virginia, it's going to only incentivize and stimulate us in even a better way and put an infusion of, a, of, a, of an incredible amount even more dollars into West Virginia. But in the meantime, if you'll just step back and look at these states and how they're screaming bloody murder and they don't know where to turn and everything else and their numbers are so bad it's off the chart and look at our numbers. Look at our numbers. We don't have that stimulus package, but look at our numbers and they keep, you know, look at our corporate net. Look at what's going on in West Virginia and everything. And we still have almost 10% of our people that are unemployed. You know, when we really get back to work and really, really get back, you know, we, we are, we, things are happening, you know, all across this state. And, uh, and, and I think we've got to be really, really pleased with where the numbers are today. Now, the, 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 the last thing I would say, add to that too, let me add this and everything. I just thought about this, but just think before COVID hit, our unemployment rate in West Virginia was, re, was absolutely the lowest that it had been, it had been in, I think, a decade. And so if we get back to there, you know, and all this, all this other stuff is happening, we're, West Virginia is doing good right now. It's just going to keep on doing good and maybe get a whole lot better. All right, thank you. Uh, let's uh, next go to Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Hi, everyone. Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Um, Delegate Linville kind of read my mind. Um, we hear these announcements, and they sound amazing and hopeful and promise for people, but sometimes um, people don't see it come to fruition. So with that said, this is a tremendous amount of money, but the terrain that we're talking about in some of these areas is tremendously difficult. Um, in addition, with contracts that get subbed out and things like that, is this going to be enough money um, to really make this project uh, sustainable for people? Thanks. You know, Delegate Limbo, you you can and 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 uh, Senator Plymo, both of y'all probably ought to be heard here just a little bit because I I, I kind of we we didn't get to you just one second ago, but I want to say just this, you know. Um, Nothing, I've never known anything in the world, you know, that's perfect. 
you know, and Amanda, you know, if, if we've got a thousand people that are starving and we're able to help 953 of them, we're going to some way double back and do something to help the other 37, are we not? You know, and uh, in fact, it may be help the other 47. But, but if, if that be the case, aren't we awfully happy that we were able to help the 953 and it won't be perfect? And absolutely, it won't be 100% but it will be so close to it compared to where we are today that we will be one bunch of happy campers. And absolutely, then we'll double back. We'll double back and try to help those that the rocks are still not turned. And that's what we're trying to do every day with the people across West Virginia that are still hungry, and that's what we're trying to do every day with these families and any and everything we can possibly do. Now, please, Delegate Lindblom and, 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 you know, Senator Plymouth, I've cut you off. Y'all talk, please. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, so in answer to your question, um, we need to go back and, and sort of look at what actually the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund does. And so there's a certain amount of money for each of these eligible census blocks that, uh, that were shown on the map. And um, if a provider um, wins the bid on that census block, um, they are bound to uh, provide service to every single home inside of that census block. And so if they do not do that, there is a sig significant and substantial penalty um, financially uh, that would be levied upon them by the Federal Communications Commission. And so in answer to your question specifically, um, quite frankly, they have to. If, um, if, if they win a bid on, on one of these census blocks, they have to do that um, or, or they will lose a significant amount of money. Um, and, and that's a credit to uh, FCC Chairman Pai and, and all the commissioners of the FCC, um, as well as our congressional delegations, um, uh, Senator Capito, um, Senator Manchin, Congresswoman um, Miller, and Congressman Mooney and McKinley, um, in, in putting that together for, for the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, in addition, just like the governor said, um, uh, I would echo his comments. Um, you can see that there are still areas that are on uh, this map that um, that have not been served. And I'm committed, and I think um, each of the panelists um, here are committed to making sure that they those people are not forgotten. And this is just the first step in a in a longer process, but it's a pretty big step um, of seven hundred and sixty six million plus dollars. And uh, thank you, Governor, for the opportunity, too. I, I will say that um, w one of the things that you have to look at on this is this, um, this problem wasn't created just automatically, and it's not just changed with one act. This is the first of many acts that I think is going to happen. And uh, the way that you, you know, take a, a go after an apple and, and eat an apple is one bite at a time. This is uh, equivalent to taking one third of the apple and, and taking it away. And now you have the rest, maybe even one half of the apple. So I think this is a large step. And the beauty of what this does, it is it secures it from the state level, but it incentivizes private sector to really get involved in this, to really make the decisions that will hit the underserved areas. So I think it's it's a, a major announcement and it's a major step in the right direction. All right, thank you, Amanda. We have one follow-up today from Paul Mullen with WCBC. Thank you very much. I um, would like to go back to the budget governor and personnel. Uh, when you put the budget together this year, of course, there were different priorities. We didn't have a pr pandemic, but we've had to respond to it uh, in a, a number of ways. Do we have any additional hiring done by the state of West Virginia? I, I'm thinking of DHHR specifically to address the pandemic. Where is that money coming from and how is that handled through the budget process? Hey, do you know? I, I, I know generally uh, one thing that has affected our ability to deal with COVID is that under the CARES Act, we can reimburse the state certain of our payroll expenses related to 
the pandemic if we, of course, follow the guidelines. We were able to do that from March 1 through June 30, we were able to mitigate a lot of the state's expenses, a lot of it DHHR and National Guard, state police, through reimbursing ourselves for the qualifying expenses. So that is an option under the CARES Act. As far as whether DHHR has changed their uh, personnel, whether they've added new positions or not, my, I want to say no, but I don't know that as I sit here today. That would be something that we could check. All right, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's a great day for West Virginia, a great day for all these people that have served so diligently and so gracefully on this, on this call. I, I don't want to forget our secretary, Ed Gonch, and I, I know I'm going to forget somebody, so please forgive me, but, uh, but I, again, I thank everybody for for a great day in West Virginia. And, and if we can get that vaccine, it would be phenomenally good. You know, we still got to, you know, that I'm still worried that we're still more than that away from, from getting it. But, uh, but at the same time, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome the day that it comes and we'll be prepared to get it out and get all of our people, you know, vaccinated and everything as soon as it comes. Uh, the other thing is just this. I want, again, to, to reiterate and tell everybody to keep, keep these great West Virginians. We've lost 237, and until it happens to you at your home and everything, we, we, we can almost be immune to the, to the, you know, to the thoughts and, and, you know, of how, just how bad, bad really is. But please, please think about those people, and and, and the other thing is I congratulate, you know, all of our people in revenue for incredible work and, uh, and the way this state's moving forward is just going to be good. And everybody's got to understand, you know, when the state economically is doing well, there's so much more that we can do to help the, the, all the people that are having a tough way to go, all the different services that we provide, all the different things that we can do we can do it with the state healthy and economically doing well. And so, and when we're not, you see that the only thing that we can do is cut. And that's what we do. We just fall back and we cut this and we cut this and we cut this. And in my opinion, every time you make a cut, somebody else leaves West Virginia. Now we know what it's like for grandma to want to have a picnic and she can't do it because all of her grandchildren are in Atlanta and Denver and wherever it may be because they had to leave West Virginia to go get a job. So what we're trying to do is diversify. Think about broadband. Think about tourism. Think about all the different things that have happened within West Virginia and are happening right now. And as we do that, grandma can have that picnic here when we have opportunities for jobs and we have opportunities for all the different goodnesses that other states have right here in West Virginia. So we want to keep our people here. We've got to first and foremost get our kids back in school when I know that. But, uh, but listen, today is a really great day. And I appreciate all the hard work that everybody on this call has given us in every way. So thank you again.